Chapter 389. Disbelief. Disbelief. It was an insanely weird thing to feel, one that a person would usually experience when they were thoroughly baffled, when they had no idea about just how a particular situation was happening. Disbelief. This was the exact feeling the Nebulon family youth was currently experiencing. He was thoroughly baffled, having no idea how he ended up in this current situation. There he was, shocked that the same white-haired demon that everyone was trying their hardest to steer clear of was looking at him coldly. And then in the next instant, he found himself suspended high up in the air. The Nebulon youth tried to do what anyone would instinctively do in this situation. He tried to speak, to ask himself just what was happening. But then he found out just how he had ended up in the air. The entirety of his jaw was shattered as spit and blood poured down from his opened mouth, leaving red streaks in the air as he kept ascending. It had been a devastating uppercut. By the time the youth reached the peak of his ascent and started descending downwards, realization struck him, instantly followed by an unimaginable amounts of pain. But the youth didn't even have the ability nor the time to scream in pain, as just as his body was about to hit the hard desks of the classroom, a devastating kick struck his form. For a suspended moment, the youth's form hung up in the air, his body leaning forward, the sheer force of the kick bending him at the waist. Then, with a sudden and explosive release of energy, the youth's form shot backwards through the class at supersonic speeds, his body hitting the sturdy wall of the class with a brutal impact. The result was as expected. The youth's body splattered against the sturdy wall, every single bone in his body immediately breaking. Silence. The silence that immediately permeated the classroom was palpable. There was not a single eye in the classroom that didn't turn to look at the form of Atticus in complete shock. The students who had been sitting close to the Nebulon youth all jumped backward with such abruptness that there was no mistaking that they were running for their lives. But the cause of this baffling situation maintained his cold gaze, which was completely fixed on the Nebulon youth on the wall. Atticus started walking towards the youth slowly. Each of the students made another stupid mistake of counting the seconds he would use to get to the youth, as in the next instance, Atticus's form blurred, and the youth whose form was already slipping down the wall was pinned against the wall again as a brutal punch landed on his stomach. An intense amount of blood immediately gushed out of the youth's mouth, splattering across the floor, his shocked expression fixed on Atticus. I, it's not working? The youth thought in slight shock. Regardless of having no idea what was happening, as soon as Atticus had kicked him, he had immediately tried to use his bloodline and create an illusion. Despite it not being potent, he was sure it would at least hold Atticus for a few seconds for him to drink a health potion and run. But unfortunately for the youth, he had no idea of Atticus's perception. Atticus didn't utter a word, he didn't even ask the Nebulon youth anything, nor did he mention why he was currently beating the living daylights out of him. The current scene was as though Atticus was beating the youth up for absolutely no reason, just because he felt like it. Atticus manipulated the air to hold the youth in place, and then suddenly grabbed the youth's hand with one hand, gripping his index finger with the other. Then, each of the students watched as Atticus slowly and brutally pulled off each one of the youth's fingers, immediately incinerating each finger as they were pulled out. The scream that resounded throughout the room was deafening, as heartbreaking as it was piercing. The youth breathed heavily, tears streaming down his face and intense amounts of mucus running down his nose. If anyone had told the other tiered youths in the hall E-class that they would ever see a tier one in this state, they would have denied it vehemently. And despite every single one of them thinking that Atticus had gone too far, none of them stepped up. Atticus finished pulling out the youth's fingers and instantly moved to his toes, eliciting another deafening scream that echoed throughout the class. After a few seconds, every single one of the youth's fingers had been pulled out and the Nebulon youth slumped down, his form completely resting on the air holding him up. Atticus controlled the air and brought the youth downward towards his height. And just as everyone thought he would finally speak, Atticus's right palm suddenly radiated an intense orange glow, 
as intense amounts of fire condensed around his palm. Without hesitation, Atticus suddenly placed his palm on the youth's face, gripping it tightly as the sound of burning flesh immediately filled the room, followed by the youth's intense screams. Atticus brutally seared the youth's face with fire, removing his hand after a few seconds, leaving a palm-shaped red mark covering the youth's face. Just as the youth was about to lose consciousness because of the pain, water suddenly enveloped his form, and the students couldn't help but tremble as Atticus healed the youth and started his brutal actions all over again. After a few minutes, with Atticus having tortured and healed the youth multiple times, the air holding the youth's form abruptly vanished, and he fell down with a huge thud. Throughout this scene, Atticus hadn't spoken a word. At this point, apart from Kale, who had his head down on the desk, seemingly not interested in the unfolding events, and Zoe, who watched everything with a smile, the rest of the Tier 1 youths already had their eyes narrowed as they watched. Chapter 390, it begins. None of the Tier 1s cared about the youth. Instead, they cared about why Atticus was doing what he was doing. Even though the Nebulon youth standing wasn't as high, he was still a Tier 1, one with talent at that. The other Nebulon family members would definitely not take kindly to Atticus's actions, but each of their gazes couldn't help but narrow into pinpricks as they saw Atticus's next actions. Atticus suddenly tapped on his artifact, and after a few seconds, the Nebulon family youth's artifact suddenly lit up as he received a notification. Apart from his pulled fingers, Atticus had already healed his body, but his current state would suggest otherwise. His form was currently trembling, as though he were being electrocuted, despite there being no single tendril of lightning on him. His hair, which had been rapidly changing, had come to an abrupt stop, settling at the color black. And despite Atticus currently looking down at him, he dared not meet Atticus's gaze. Finally, after all of his brutal actions, Atticus's cold words suddenly sounded as he spoke. I will give you only one chance. If you refuse, I will take you out of this class, and you will spend the rest of the seven hours of the day feeling unimaginable pain that you will remember for the rest of your life. Sign the contract. You have three seconds, Atticus declared. If one was persistent and consistent enough, even the most proud and stubborn would eventually break. The students currently watching knew this fact well, which was why it wasn't surprising that before Atticus had even finished speaking, the Nebulon family youth's trembling hand had already moved as he clicked on his artifact with the stump where his index finger should have been. And without even reading it, he immediately accepted the contract. It was at that same instance that the door to the classroom suddenly slid open, and Isabella couldn't help but raise an eyebrow as she saw the state of the classroom. Many of the students were currently standing, their gazes still fixed on Atticus and the Nebulon youth, the area around the duo completely filled with blood. Is he finally retaliating? Isabella pondered excitedly. Come to me after class, Atticus simply instructed, turned, and started walking towards his seat with everyone's gazes fixed on his form. As Atticus got to his seat a few seconds later, he locked gazes with Zoe and gave her a charming wink, mouthing a mouth. Now who's the softy? Zoe rolled her eyes while shaking her head with a smile. You learned from the best. You're welcome, Zoe muttered a response as Atticus sat down on his seat, causing Atticus to chuckle slightly in response. Isabella completely ignored the brutal scene as she made her way to the front of the classroom. She turned her gaze towards the Nebulon youth on the floor and coldly stated, Jordan and Nebulon, if you would please find your way to your seat, class is about to begin, Isabella instructed. Jordanen's limbs trembled intensely on the floor as he tried to get up. Each of the students watched, some with pity in their gazes, as he stood and walked towards his seat, his legs trembling throughout his walk. Then, Isabella started the class as though a brutal scene hadn't just happened. The leader's section wasn't the only place where a brutal scene would unfold. We need to talk to him. Nate suddenly spoke up as he and Lucas made their way through the expansive grassland of the non-leaders section. Both of them were currently wearing completely black glasses over their eyes as they walked. I knew this was coming. Lucas responded with a small sigh. You won't understand because your specialty is in runes. 
You don't really need battles to grow, Nate explained in a serious tone. He suddenly turned towards Lucas and continued, I've always wanted to become a warrior my father can be proud of. You know this. If this situation should continue, we'd end up useless. Lucas locked gazes with Nate for a few seconds before advising, You should do it after all of this ends. Of course. Before Nate could offer a response, the both of them suddenly spotted the forms of two of their targets, both with iridescent eyes and hair color that was rapidly changing. Their reactions were instant. Lucas suddenly pulled a rune from his space ring and immediately channeled his mana, tossing it towards one of the youths. The slate let out an intense glow as golden tendrils of light suddenly materialized out of it, wrapping around one of the youths, immobilizing him. Before the second youth could react, Nate's bulky form suddenly rocketed towards his form, a cataclysmic punch landing on the youth's face, immediately deforming his face. There were no words spoken, no heads up about anything. The Nebulon family had attacked one of their own, and the Ravensteins were never ones to back off from a fight. There was only one outcome possible after the Nebulon family attacked Aurora. War. In multiple locations in the non-leaders section, crowds gathered around each location as each crowd watched as different brutal scenes unfolded. At one location, an excited voice of Moon suddenly sounded as she exclaimed, Oh my god, Aurora, you're so strong! It didn't even last two seconds. Moon complimented, completely ignoring the crowd that had gathered around the area, watching the scene, each of them baffled. On the floor were the forms of four youths, each of them spotting the same distinct features as the Nebulon family and a large charred fist imprint on their faces. In the middle of these youths writhing on the floor stood Aurora, who turned to look at Moon with mild awkwardness. Erm, thanks a slight blush appearing on her cheeks. In the next instant, her gaze turned cold as she looked at the youths on the floor and with a thought, each of their forms suddenly erupted into flames, their intense screams resounding across the area. Chapter 391, Madmen. Just like Lucas and Nate, both Ember and Moon had been wearing the same exact black glasses over their eyes. Both Aurora and Moon watched coldly as the forms of multiple Nebulon family youths screamed and struggled on the floor as they got burned. Amongst the crowd, there was not a single person who wasn't recording the unfolding events. Did the Ravenstein and Nebulon families have some kind of dispute? All of their minds raced as they tried to figure out what was happening. In another part of the academy, the same brutal scene was unfolding as the usual crowd gathered around an area each of their gazes fixed on the ongoing torture, the sounds of repetitive thuds and murmurs filling the space. Scorch marks littered the ground, and sprawled across the earth were two youths whose forms kept twitching and spasming as tendrils of lightning snaked their way across their bodies. Each of them spotted multiple charred fist imprints all over their forms. With his whole form crackling with lightning, Elijah turned his gaze towards Chubby, who was currently on top of a third Nebulon youth, a maniacal grin on his face as he kept delivering fire-imbued punches to the youth's face. Each punch was as devastating as it was brutal. Each time a punch landed, the point of impact instantly became charred black. And considering the staggering number of punches Chubby had unleashed already, the entirety of the youth's face was pitch black. And despite this, Chubby still showed no signs of stopping. It goes without saying that there was no one amongst the Ravenstein youths who hadn't been pissed when they heard Aurora had been attacked. Following Atticus's orders was the best way for them to vent this intense anger they were feeling on the perpetrators. Chubby, Kai. Despite Elijah's fervent calls, Chubby still kept up unleashing brutal punches. Elijah sighed. Chubby, my boy, if you keep that up, we won't get a chance to accomplish what the young master asked us to do. You don't want him to hear that it was your fault, right? These words seemed to do the trick, as Chubby's fist, heading towards the youth's head, abruptly stopped in the air, the flames enveloping his fist getting snuffed out instantly. Chubby's maniacal grin immediately morphed as he opened his eyes wide. He awkwardly cleared his throat and quickly stood up straight, walking away and putting a significant distance between himself and the sprawled youths, as though they were the plague. Elijah shook his head as he gazed at Chubby's exaggerated response. 
The boy truly was frightened of Atticus, and it was a completely baffling situation, as neither Elijah nor the other Ravensteins had ever witnessed them having any interaction together. In fact, they couldn't even say they had seen them speaking to each other before. Both Elijah and Chubby spotted the same black glasses the other Ravenstein youths were wearing. Seeing that Chubby had listened, Elijah's gaze turned cold as he looked towards the youths on the floor, the tendrils of lightning surrounding his body intensifying. In another part of the academy, another crowd of students was gathered around, watching a similar brutal scene unfolding. Against the wall of an imposing building, four youths who had the same distinct features of the Nebulon family were pinned down. Each of their limbs was spread out in different directions, pierced by an arrow, holding their forms up on the sturdy wall. Their screams were deafening as each of the youths continued shouting, and despite the familiar sign of their bloodline activating, their hair changing color rapidly, it didn't seem to have even the slightest effect against their tormentors. The figures of Eric and Arya maintained their cold and detached look as they closed the distance between them and the Nebulon youths pinned on the wall. They both sported the same black glasses over their eyes. Eric and Arya had always been aloof, neither of them speaking much. Eric still maintained his army cut short white hair and dreary black eyes, while Arya had her hair tied into a ponytail with light green eyes. To the current onlookers, it didn't even seem as though they planned on saying anything to the Nebulon youths. Their plan was crystal clear to those currently watching. Torture. Eric placed his hand on one of his daggers fixed at his back and immediately unsheathed it. The forms of the Nebulon youths trembled as he inched closer to them, blood streaming continuously from their wounds. As soon as Eric got close enough, each of the onlookers' eyes widened as he suddenly stabbed the youth in his arm and started moving the dagger around his body, gutting him brutally. Arya simply watched from behind as he moved to the others, inflicting the same brutal torment upon each of them. There was not a single youth who wasn't recording the current brutal scene, and this same fact held for all the other places where the Nebulon youths were being tortured. With not even a few minutes having passed since they had all been transported to the academy campus, many of the first-year Nebulon family youths had been hunted down and tortured in front of different crowds of students. With just a few minutes to go until class started, the videos of the Ravenstein family youths torturing the Nebulon youths spread like wildfire amongst the first years, and each of the students couldn't help but tremble as they saw the brutality of the Ravenstein family. They had all already gotten a taste of how cold and brutal Atticus could be after watching the video of him and the other third years. But now, watching all the other Ravenstein youths in action, a solemn reminder settled in each of their thoughts. It was something all of them grew up hearing from other people in the human domain. It was the same title that was given to the Ravenstein family ever since their establishment. Truly, they were a family of madmen. Chapter 392, Effect After the altercation between the Ravenstein family and the Nebulon family, all of the first years found their way to class after a few minutes. Every single one of them was talking about the same thing, the Ravenstein and the Nebulon family. Were they going to war? What had happened? If the first years were fighting, what would happen to the higher years? Families, especially the tiered ones, weren't so united. There was a lot of dissatisfaction among some of their members. But regardless, when they were threatened by outside forces, they would all come together. This had been what the Ravenstein had done, and it was the same for the other Tier 1 families. The first-year Ravenstein youths had attacked and brutally tortured members of the Nebulon family in front of everyone. Many of the students were curious. What would happen when the higher years found out about the situation? Aurora arrived at her class after a few minutes, her cold gaze through her black glasses instantly scanning the entirety of the classroom. Unfortunately, she didn't have superpowered perception like Atticus, but she was still able to accomplish this feat in under a minute. After scanning the classroom, she wasn't able to find the youth she was looking for, Zephyr. Atticus had already told her who he suspected was responsible for her ambush. Despite looking everywhere on her way here, 
she hadn't seen any signs of him. The thought of him hiding himself with an illusion didn't even cross her mind. There was a reason she and every other Ravenstein youth were wearing these black glasses over their eyes, and it definitely wasn't for decoration. Ever since his battle against Zephyr during the Academy entrance test, Atticus had found out just how the Nebulon family youth created their illusions. He had no idea of the process and couldn't even replicate it if he tried, but Atticus knew that the major ingredient was mana. They manipulated the mana in the surrounding and used it to fool their target's senses. It was as easy as that. This couldn't work on Atticus because he could feel the true mana in the surrounding, courtesy of his incredible perception. But Aurora and the rest of the Ravenstein youths didn't have this luxury, and this was why Atticus had immediately ventured into the Academy store when he saw that the battle with the Nebulon youths was inevitable. These glasses were called the Mana Clear glasses, and their effect was pretty straightforward. They simply neutralized the effects of mana on the wearer in their field of vision. The meaning was clear. The wearer would see and only see what was physically there. These glasses, of course, weren't absolute. In fact, they weren't even made for the purpose of seeing past illusions. But as Atticus browsed through the Academy shop, he came across this item and immediately bought it after unleashing a massacre in the forest and gaining points. And lo and behold, it worked perfectly. Atticus had also given the Ravenstein youths a few items, each of them aimed at making sure they were well prepared. Seeing as Zephyr hadn't shown up, Aurora went to her seat and sat down like nothing was happening. The youths who had previously been seated beside or behind her had all already moved far away from their seats before she even entered the classroom. The tier ones weren't excluded. The majority still had no idea why the Ravenstein had done that to the Nebulon family, and they had no intention of being next. At one side of the classroom sat a white-haired girl who gazed at her front coldly, both her arms crossed on her chest. Her immediate surrounding seats were empty as each of the students sat at a distance from her, most of them murmuring and whispering. A certain red-haired boy fixed his gaze on Aurora's form, a smirk playing on his lips. As the door of the classroom opened, Lark turned his gaze away from Aurora and faced his front. As soon as the lectures for the day ended, Isabella left the classroom, immediately followed by the rest of the class. They had all heard what Atticus had said to the Nebulon family youth and knew he would want to use the classroom to talk to him. Each of the Tier 1 youths had darkened expressions as they streamed out of the classroom. Atticus had just enslaved another Tier 1. Although this was far from the first time students were being enslaved, this instance was different. He had done it to a Tier 1, one who was the leader of a division. Of course, the Academy was far from being stupid. Even though they allowed members of other division youths get enslaved, the same was different for the leaders. It came with a lot of restrictions. And it was this same restriction that Atticus had gotten when the Nebulon youth had signed the contract. If a leader signed an enslavement contract, the enslaver could not ask said leader to perform any action that would be detrimental to his her division. Atticus could ask for any information contained in his head, even about his division, but he couldn't force him to sabotage his division. Plus, the fact that any academy contract becomes obsolete during the division wars. Basically, Atticus had no power over the Nebulon youth during any division wars against him or another person. But the fact that he had enslaved a Tier 1 seemed to make them realize that the same could happen to them. There was nothing stopping him from doing it. It had long since been determined that Atticus was out of their league. After a few seconds, the class was almost emptied, remaining only four individuals. Kale stood up straight and yawned for a bit before he turned towards Atticus, meeting his gaze and with a short nod, he left the room. Now only Atticus, Zoe, and the Nebulon youth remained in the room. Come, Atticus's cold voice suddenly sounded across the classroom, and the trembling form of the Nebulon youth knelt down in front of him in the next instant. Chapter 393, Useful. As soon as the Nebulon youth knelt down in front of Atticus, Atticus immediately focused his aura on him. The youth's already trembling form trembled even harder, his whole body covered in sweat. 
Zoe had chosen to stay behind and watch, and Atticus hadn't seen any problem with that. He welcomed it even, and after a few long minutes of drilling the Nebulon youth for information, with the youth getting shocked on multiple occasions, Atticus had been satisfied with the results he got. Zoe had been a huge help during the questioning, even going as far as to ask some questions he hadn't thought of. After asking the Nebulon youth everything he wanted to ask, Atticus gave him some instructions and dismissed him. He also walked Zoe to her teleportation room. After discussing with her for a while, they both separated, and Atticus started heading towards the elevator, intending to find a particular aloof, white-haired girl in the garden. During his elevator ride, Atticus entered a deep contemplation. From all the information he had gotten from the Nebulon family youth, although it hadn't been related at all to who was currently targeting him, Atticus had been able to get some information about the current state of the Nebulon first-year youths. Even though Jordanand, the Nebulon youth Atticus just tortured, was the leader of their division, Zephyr had used his standing in the Nebulon family and the power and authority he held over the others to take control of the division. Jordanand was basically their leader in name only and had absolutely no power back in his division. In fact, just because Zephyr had to join his division, the latter had chosen to make Jordanand's life in the division a living hell. After a few more questions, Atticus had been able to find out that Jordanand had absolutely no idea about the ambush on Aurora. The youth didn't even know anything about what was happening in the division. The only time he was of use was when Zephyr wanted to buy division buildings or check what was in the division store. Jordanan had also mentioned not seeing Zephyr at all before he came to the academy campus, leading Atticus to believe that he had probably not shown up at the non-leaders section. After a few more precise questions, Atticus was able to find out basically everything about Zephyr. His character, how he thinks, what he liked. This had been the area he had gotten Zoe's help from. He had been a little shocked about the way she basically dissected his whole life. And after finding all of this out, Atticus's earlier 90% certainty had been bumped up to 99%. He had been 90% sure that Zephyr wasn't the mastermind of this attack on him, and all this information about his character only seemed to show how right he had been. Atticus reached the bottom floor of the building, the elevator door parting open for him. All right then, I guess the earlier plan still stands, because as much chaos as possible. Atticus stepped out of the building and walked through the expansive garden, intending to find Ember. After a few minutes, he found Ember around the area and instantly approached. Atticus simply wanted to brief Ember about the current situation, just in case they had any intention of repeating the same thing that happened with Aurora to Ember. She also had someone that she would be devastated if said person suddenly appeared in front of her. Atticus simply didn't want a repeat of that, so he decided to be careful. After briefly explaining the current situation to Ember and emphasizing the way Aurora had been attacked, her reaction had been completely expected, unfazed. It wasn't that she was trying to claim that she wasn't scared about the Nebulon youths. Ember simply didn't care about all that was happening. Despite the years spent in the Ravenstein estate together, Ember and Aurora had never gotten close. Although they had occasionally gone out together, this was only because of Atticus, and Ember's quiet nature made it hard for her and Aurora to form any sort of bond. The former was always training, and the latter was either always with Atticus or hanging out with Anastasia. And regardless of the fact that they had attacked a member of their family, Ember didn't care. It would have definitely been a different case if it had been Atticus. Many might call her cold and brutal, but Atticus expected and understood her completely. Even he couldn't complain because he would have probably reacted the same way if he were in her shoes. If a second-year Ravenstein member had been attacked, a member who wasn't under him or didn't know on a personal level, Atticus wouldn't have gone out of his way to help, which was why he wasn't surprised about her reaction. Seeing he had appropriately warned her, Atticus suddenly took out the same medallion with multiple earrings fixed on top of it, removed one, and gave it to Ember, who showed a slight shock on her face. It was obvious to her that it was an artifact, a powerful one at that, 
but it had been a while since someone had given her something. She had really missed Atticus. Ember smiled a bit and softly muttered, Thanks, as Atticus channeled mana and fixed the earring on her ear. After finishing his business with Ember, they both separated, and Atticus headed directly towards his teleportation room and back to his division. As soon as Atticus got back, he met with Aurora and the other Ravenstein youths, intending on receiving a report about what had happened at the non-leaders section. And after a few minutes, dealing with Nate's excited and hyper energy, Atticus nodded his head in satisfaction. Although not perfectly, they more or less accomplished what they set out to do, create chaos. And as a plus, they had been able to enslave some of the Nebulon family youths. Unfortunately for them, Zephyr wasn't the true leader of his division. Asking them to commit suicide would do absolutely nothing to him. They had each only instructed them to report back to the academy campus the next day and every other day. At the very least, they would be useful for information. Chapter 394 Decimated After listening to all the information about everything that had happened in the non-leaders section during the day, Atticus gave the Ravenstein youth some more instructions for a few more minutes before leaving the mansion in which they had all been gathered. Atticus immediately headed towards the advanced training room to train. He had missed out on the elemental room for a few days now, and after informing Zoe about what was happening, she had wanted to lend him some points. Atticus had pondered on it for a while and decided to refuse. He wanted this to be some form of punishment for him, a sort of reminder that because he had been too focused on training and other things, he had allowed his enemies to get one over him. After he solved this current issue and found the perpetrator, he would continue his training in the elemental room. The next day came by quickly, and just as Atticus had anticipated, the rumor had spread throughout the whole academy, and most importantly, to the higher years. They had each watched the videos of the Ravenstein youth's brutality against the Nebulon youths. Both parties, the higher years of the Ravenstein and the Nebulon families, had immediately consulted the first years in order to find out just exactly what was going on. Amongst the second and third years of the Ravenstein family, one would see the familiar figures of Hela, Sophie, and surprisingly, Orion. Most of them hadn't changed much since the Raven camp. The first, Hela, had shown up because of her ginormous sense of duty, while the second, Sophie, had always been a hyper busybody. There was no way she was missing out on something this interesting. And then the last, Orion. Since after the incident where the Raven camp had been attacked, Orion's personality had gone through a major change, and this was mainly due to his father, Sirius. Immediately since Sirius had heard about what happened in the Raven camp with how terribly Orion had treated Atticus, he had made it his goal to educate his foolish son about the ways of the world. Many surprising and awkward events happened during Atticus's five-year training, and one of them had been Sirius forcing Orion to bow before Atticus and apologize. Of course, the latter vehemently refused to do it initially, but with Sirius present, Orion dared not to disobey. Atticus had of course played everything cool in order to give Sirius face. He respected the man after all. After the incident and a few more forceful educations from Sirius, Orion's overconfident personality took a nosedive as he became more humbled. He had meddled in this situation because of his father's incessant warnings and advice to get closer to and form any sort of relationship with Atticus. An advice Orion understood well, considering the power Atticus had unleashed during the escape at the Raven Camp. And seeing as it was the first years that had been rampaging, it was very obvious that Atticus was involved. As they each got briefed on the situation, as expected, the first years had been following Atticus's instructions. And just as Atticus had anticipated, the trio and the other Ravenstein youths that came forward immediately decided to join in on the war. And it went without saying that the higher years of the Nebulon family raged when they found out what was going on. The first year youths gave each of them mana clear glasses and some other equipment, just as Atticus had instructed. And just like that, on the second day, the battle that was supposed to involve only the first years immediately spiraled out into a full-blown war between the Ravenstein family and the Nebulon family in the academy. And as the higher years joined, 
the fights became more intense as the damage to the school and even innocent students immediately skyrocketed. Many of them even went as far as to employ their exosuits against enemies. The academy instantly turned into a war zone. It became a normal occurrence to see groups of Ravenstein youths, each of them sporting their manaclear glasses, and groups of Nebulon family youths moving together around the campus. And as soon as both groups were spotted within vicinity, each and every single one of the students present in the area would immediately disperse and scatter. No one had any intention of being the collateral damage. However, despite the damage, no instructor nor academy staff even tried to stop the ongoing battle. The destroyed walls and areas were repaired and revived before the next day, without any of the students even finding out how. As the days went by, with hundreds of multiple battles happening around the academy campus, it became very certain that the Nebulon family youths were fighting a losing battle. Through and through, the Ravenstein family had always been a warrior family, and although the Nebulon family were also strong in their own way, but with their most powerful ability, their illusions, taken away from them, they stood no chance against the Ravenstein family youths. As the days passed, the Nebulon family kept on getting decimated. No one needed to tell the onlookers. It was plenty obvious that it was only a matter of time before the Nebulon family got completely crushed. Each of the students were once again reminded of the might of the Ravenstein family. In all the fights the students had witnessed, the Ravensteins had never lost a fight. And what was even more baffling for them was the fact that during the fights, each of the Ravenstein youths, especially the first years, all wore intense grins on their faces. Even when torturing the Nebulon family youths, it was quite obvious that they were all happy about their current situation. The words mad men kept on resonating in each of the students' heads. In the middle of a bustling area filled with different students throttling about, the ground beside the large imposing terminal suddenly let out a golden glow that illuminated the whole area, and from it, the form of a red-haired youth materialized, a wide grin on his face. Chapter 395, Hove Total. With a wide grin on his face, Dell stepped forward and started walking away from the terminal ground his walking gait reflecting his distinguished position not only as a member of a Tier 1 family, but also as one of its important heirs. Dell's gaze glanced to the side to see a similarly red-haired youth who immediately bowed as he got to his side and greeted respectfully. Welcome back, young master. It was none other than the same youth who had reported the beginning of the attack on Atticus to Dell. Dell gave the youth a quick glance, the disdain completely evident in his eyes as he continued walking without stopping, his wide grin unchanged. Seeing as he had no choice, the youth, with his head still bowed, followed after Dell. This current camp couldn't be compared to the camp of the first years, or even Atticus's camp. The campgrounds were completely paved, and there were multiple, large and developed, futuristic-looking buildings all around the camp. It was quite obvious that compared to the first years, the second years had gone far in terms of their camp development. Dell walked through the campgrounds, and the members of his division immediately reacted as soon as they saw that Dell had arrived. Regardless of how far the students were from him, as long as they were in his field of view, each and every one of the students bowed as he walked. It was as though the entirety of the students in the camp stopped whatever they were doing and bowed to show their respects, as though a king walking amidst his people. Dell simply walked, ignoring every single one of the bowed youth. Although his expression seemed unchanged, it was plenty obvious that he was reveling in every single second of this scene. The feeling of being worshipped was awesome. What's the status? After a few awkward moments of walking, Dell suddenly spoke up and asked, at this point, the other year two Alvirian youths had already joined the duo, each of them walking behind Dell. It's going as planned, young master. The whole Ravenstein and Nebulon families are fighting. Dell came to an abrupt stop as he heard those words, the grin on his face widening. As though the others had already anticipated this response, they all simultaneously stopped, in sync with him. Good, good. Now his attention would be diverted. Dell said with an incredibly satisfied expression on his face. 
Then he started moving again as he continued. Are the others ready? Dell asked. You just have to say the word, young master. We're all ready. Dell turned his gaze backward to see each of the youths showing determined expressions on their faces, and he couldn't help but silently click his tongue while muttering under his breath, Cocksuckers! He knew why they were acting this way towards him. They all obviously wanted to form a connection with him. He was the strongest candidate among the heirs in the Alverian family. Unlike the Ravenstein main family, which had only Atticus as an heir, the Alverian family was different. Eleanor, the family head of the Alverian family, had married multiple wives and given birth to numerous sons and daughters. The only reason Dell and Lila were currently being favored in the Alverian family was exactly because of their unmatched talent in both the art of alchemy and in battle. Their battle strength was comparable to the youths from normal battle families. There was only one person who could be a threat to his position in the family, and it was none other than his lovely sister, Leela. Dell had perceived signs of some of the elders in their family who were subtly supporting Lila instead of him. For all I know, one of them could be a spy. Dell had always been paranoid, incredibly so. I should adjust their contracts and turn them into slaves. Dell shook his head and decided to leave this for later. He had pressing matters to attend to. Start the next phase, he suddenly commanded, prompting the youth and the other Alverian youths walking behind him to simultaneously bow their heads and respond, As you wish, young master. At the next instant, they each excused themselves, leaving Dell alone with his thoughts. The days went by quickly, and the war between the Ravenstein and Nebulon youths still continued. If the onlookers hadn't been certain before, now it was 100% sure that the Ravenstein family youths would be the winners of this war. The Nebulon family youths were basically decimated already, as it became a very rare occurrence to see any of them walking through the academy. The remaining ones didn't even dare attend classes or show up to the academy campus. The very few that remained all simply stayed back at their divisions, intending to wait out the intense situation. The higher years weren't different. Initially, the higher years hadn't gone full throttle, especially at the start, with only a few battles happening here and there. But after the tension started escalating every day, the higher years had eventually joined in fully. After receiving reports from the Ravenstein youths about the Nebulon youths' movements, Atticus had immediately instructed them to command the enslaved Nebulon youths to sneak attack the ones that refused to come to the academy campus. Although doing so would alert the others that some of them in the Nebulon family worked for the Ravensteins. Atticus had still decided to go this route. He had basically already found out everything he needed about Zephyr and the other Nebulon family youths from the enslaved youths. They all literally didn't any other use except for this. Their primary target had been one person, Zephyr, and Atticus had instructed them to make it as painful as possible. After that night, the days once again passed. And on a particular afternoon, in a very secluded spot in the non-leaders section of the academy campus, a total of a hundred youths were gathered. Chapter 396, Mass Crying A crowd of students gathered in one of the secluded areas in the non-leaders section of the academy campus. This same crowd numbered exactly one hundred, and each of them looked haggard and pathetic. Their hair was unkempt, with most of it oily and sticking to their faces. Some of them even displayed signs of malnutrition, many of their stomachs rumbling. It was quite obvious that they hadn't been eating well. Their clothes were filled with stains, and with one look at the students, one would know for certain that they weren't friends with hygiene. It would take an individual with a significantly strong will and the ability to withstand foul stenches to stand within this crowd and not immediately feel nauseated. These gathered youths were the same 100 youths that a certain red-haired youth had used to kickstart his payback at Atticus. The 100 youths he had secretly tortured and enslaved. Although Atticus had initially planned to play everything cool after he had first found out about the enslaved 100, everything changed when Aurora had been attacked. It became abundantly clear that the unknown perpetrator not only meant business, but also had multiple plans in store for Atticus and his division members. 
Atticus's decision had been happily supported by the other Ravenstein youths who had from the start wanted to lock the 100 students away and throw away the key. After Atticus made that decision, the following events had been instant. Each of the 100 youths had been thrown out of the campgrounds, forced to live on the other side of the camp walls. No buildings had been made for them, and they weren't even allowed access to eat in the mess hall. Basically, their standard of living went from good to terrible in an instant. With no access to the mess hall, they had to source food for themselves, and the same was true for other amenities. The barracks had constant running water, even hot steamy water, and this was all for free. But with access to that gone, they were literally forced to survive in the wilderness. They had been incredibly lucky that they still had experience in hunting, and most importantly, their weapons and armor. Otherwise, they would most definitely starve. Many would call that brutal, but from the very beginning, Atticus had always been brutal. All of them stood at the corner, the dissatisfied murmurs of the crowd echoing around the area. And after a few minutes of impatiently waiting, each of them spotted the figures of multiple youths all dressed in black attire that covered their whole forms and masks on their faces, approaching them. The murmurs of the crowd immediately quieted down as each of the black-clothed individuals started spreading out, each of them standing on different sides of the crowd, surrounding them. The youths displayed no surprised expression on their faces as they saw these individuals. They were obviously already used to this situation. This had always been how their enslavers had related to them, completely clothed, covering their faces. Till now, not even they knew their identities, but because each of them had signed an academy contract with one of them, the only thing they knew was one and only one name of a student among them, Dennis Ruthor. Many, especially those who already knew that the perpetrators were a particular red-haired family, would be shocked at this name. Why were they enslaved by a youth whose name was mentioned for the first time ever? That would be because our mastermind Dell was paranoid. He had chosen to be careful. He didn't want the name Alverian known to them, even though they were under a contract. So he had enslaved one youth in his division and then asked said youth to serve as the contractor for the academy contract. The murmuring crowd immediately quieted down as one of the individuals stepped up to face each of the gathered youths. He had an average height of five feet six inches, and he radiated a certain sort of aura that many would deem as annoying. No one needed to even tell the gathered youths. They all know. You they would end up hating this youth. The youth was currently wearing a white mask with a smiley face. The youth suddenly turned his gaze backwards and nodded towards a random student also clothed in black attire. The student nodded back, his shoulders slumping as he suddenly spoke, his voice resonating across the area. I command you all to kneel. The gathered youth didn't seem to understand what was going on each of them turning their gazes and looking at each other. But as though on cue, their artifacts suddenly lit up as tendrils of lightning snaked out of them, instantly electrocuting each of the youths. No one needed to explain what was going on anymore as each of them immediately sunk down on both knees, swiftly kneeling down. The youth with the annoying aura nodded his head in delight, clearly reveling in the moment, and after a few seconds, he started addressing them. Listen up! Here are your new orders. Each of the youths couldn't help but put on despairing looks as they heard this. It was very obvious already that these people were targeting Atticus. They all still hadn't recovered from his anger the last time, and these people actually wanted them to do another thing? Each of their forms started trembling hard on the floor. There was no one in the academy who didn't know that the Ravensteins were currently in a war, and also the Ravenstein brutality. They all basically lived with those white-haired monsters. If they were to cause another disturbance in the division, wouldn't their lives in the academy be over? The subtle sounds of sobbing suddenly filled the space, followed by the sound of youth sucking in their mucus. The black-clothed youth surrounding the area watched with cold gazes as each of the students on their knees suddenly started sobbing, drops of tears falling on top of the grass. Chapter 397. Brood. 
It was the sort of tears that one would shed when they wanted to brood about the unfairness of the world. They had all been happy that they had a fair leader like Atticus. It wasn't like Atticus was nice to them, far from that. But he had done one better. He had given each of them a comfortable place to live, even though they had been suddenly thrust into the middle of a forest. And most importantly, he had given each of them the ability to fight for themselves, to hunt beasts, and gain experience. For the first time in their lives, they didn't feel useless and weak. He was completely fair to everyone and didn't actively seek to exploit them, even though it was very easy for him to. Even though each of them they were scared of Atticus, there was not a single person in the division that wasn't happy that Atticus was their leader. If they had known that Atticus had been their target from the beginning, perhaps the current situation would have been different. They might have not have accepted so easily. The Alvirians had made it seem as though it was just random bullying. The fact that each divisions were divided across the academy made it all easier, which was why it was so painful. They were starting to enjoy their time in the academy. They were starting to believe they weren't so useless in life anymore. And all of that was abruptly taken away from them by these black-clothed bastards. The students who had earlier been sobbing suddenly wiped away their tears in unison, and as though they each reached a mutual understanding without even needing to speak, they each suddenly turned their gazes towards the youth who had asked them to kneel earlier, their gazes becoming bloodshot. They each had nothing to lose anymore. They would at least revel in the fact that they had taken one of them down. But reality had always been a big bitch. With bloodshot eyes, just as they all wanted to scatter and attack, the same usual bright glow occurred, and each of them ended up getting the living daylights shocked out of them. The five-seven youth who had been addressing them earlier gazed at them coldly without any hint of remorse in his gaze. And after a few moments, the artifact stopped electrocuting them. With each of the youth twitching on the floor, the youth continued addressing them. After I'm done talking to you, you will each be given multiple explosives. With these explosives, you all have two options. Wear them on you and sneak to the mansion where Atticus Ravenstein is sleeping in the division tonight and detonate it, or simply plant them around the mansion and wait for him to enter it before detonating. You all are to choose the best method depending on the situation, and most importantly, do it simultaneously, the youth explained in a happy tone. To everyone listening, it was very obvious that he was happy about the order he was giving out. And as the students on the floor all heard his order, a cold shiver ran down each of their spines. He wanted them to bomb the mansion where that white-haired devil would be sleeping? What? Why not just kill them here and now? At the very least, they wouldn't have to go through the frightening possibility of earning his ire. Despite the number of times they had each seen Atticus's brutality, they had never once gotten used to it. There was not a single one of them who didn't pray every day to not be on the receiving end of Atticus's wrath. And this was exactly where this bastard was sending them. None of their lives were in danger. Even if they were to wear the bombs on themselves, their artifact would still protect them. But it was quite unfortunate that the same thing applied to Atticus. Even if they bombed the mansion, they would still have to face Atticus afterward. And the thought of doing that terrified every single one of them to the core. The youth could see the way each of the students sprawled across the floor was trembling, but he didn't seem to care about it at all, and he turned and gave the youth behind him another nod. The youth's show, Ulders slumped once more. It was clear that he was being forced to control the enslaved students, but he had no choice but to obey. I command you all to obey everything he had just asked you to do to the last detail. You are all dismissed, the youth commanded. And although reluctant at first, each of the youth started standing up one by one, many of their muscles still having occasional spasms, and they each started walking away from the area. After a few seconds, they had all left the area, leaving behind the black-clothed youths. One of the youths suddenly approached the five seven-in youth and spoke, The higher years are already set, we're going to be late, Lark. Lark turned his gaze towards the youth and rubbed his hands together in mild anticipation. Ha <laughs> ha, 
I can't wait to put those white-haired bastards in their place. Let's go. We don't want to be late. Lark declared and immediately started walking briskly away from the area with the rest of the youths in tow. It was still morning, and the expansive grassland of the academy campus in the non-leaders section was basically devoid of other students, as each of them was already settled in their respective classes. All except the Alvirian youths and the 100 they had summoned. And just like that, the area which was initially filled with people suddenly became empty, each of the students that had left completely oblivious to the piercing blue eyes that had watched the whole scene. I see those two words reverberated in Atticus's mind like the striking of a bell, resonating deeply as he tried to comprehend what he had just witnessed. This ontent is taken from Chapter 398, Mastermind. I see. Those two words resonated inside Atticus's head continuously like a loud drum echoing in a silent cave. The sound of Isabella speaking in the room became a muted symphony as Atticus entered a state of deep contemplation. He had just come to an important conclusion, an answer that would put a stop to everything that was currently happening. Atticus was currently inside the classroom in his usual seat between Zoe and Kale. As one would have expected, class was currently ongoing with Isabella teaching the students about the Zorvans. This had been what he had been doing earlier, listening attentively in class. And this had been until he had suddenly received a notification on his artifact. Upon subtly checking the notification, Atticus had been plenty surprised to see that it was about a particular alert he had set more than two weeks ago. Many would wonder, what alert? And to answer that question, one would have to go back to a few weeks ago, on the same exact day that Atticus had first lost 100% of his points. On that day, after finding out that someone had enslaved 100 members of his division, Atticus had knocked out each of the youths, and without them knowing, he had taken each of them into the forest. No one, not even the Ravenstein youth, knew what Atticus had done inside that forest. He had stealthily carried the 100 youths into the forest and came back to the camp after a few minutes. What Atticus had done in the forest had been three things. He unleashed a massacre in the forest, even going as far as to use the katana art for speed in order to gain a massive amount of points. And after that, Atticus had paid a visit to the academy store. Then, after a few seconds of browsing through the items in the store at fast speeds, Atticus's gaze abruptly stopped, locking in on one of the items. Whisper Strand The Whisper Strand was an ingenious, advanced-rank artifact designed to seamlessly merge with the strands of an individual's hair, making it virtually undetectable. When activated, the Whisper Strand emitted nanobots that covertly weaved themselves into the hair follicles, integrating with the hair's structure at a molecular level. This integration is so subtle that individuals below the advanced rank would not even be aware of their presence. Once merged with the hair, the whisper strand would function as a sophisticated monitoring device, silently monitoring and storing every aspect of the wearer's experiences and interactions. It was an advanced technology that ensured it remained operational regardless of the wearer's activities, including bathing or even styling their hair. And then the most important feature, Atticus could remotely access the device from his artifact, allowing him to see whatever the bugged youths were seeing. Of course, these weren't foolproof. It was an advanced level artifact, and although subtle, each of them emitted faint amounts of mana that would be easily detected by an advanced rank individual. But unfortunately for Lark and the other Alvirian youths that had addressed them, they had each been below the advanced rank. Each Whisper Strand had been priced at 18,000 Academy points, and after unleashing his full power in the forest, he was able to gather enough points to buy a certain number of them and plant them on many of the hundred youths. As soon as Atticus had found out about the enslaved 100 youths, this had been his plan from the outset. Many would believe that Atticus had chosen to be passive because he didn't know what to do, but then they would be wrong. Atticus's plan had been to make it seem as though he didn't know what to do, as though he didn't have any plan at all. He allowed each of the 100 youths to attend classes just for this reason. And this was all so that any time they approached any one of the youths, 
his artifact would alert him, and he would be able to know and see his attackers. Some more perceptive people would ask, it was an obvious strategy, could the attackers be so dumb as to not take any measure, S for this? And well, the answer was quite simple. Each of the youths had strategy, could the attackers be so dumb as to not take any measures for this? Signed an academy contract. They couldn't divulge any information about the attacker to Atticus, and Atticus could bet a fortune that they were also mandated not to betray them in any way. Knowingly wearing a monitoring device was obviously breaching that rule. And this had been exactly the reason Atticus had done this without them or anyone knowing about it. The second precaution was them covering their whole form in order not to get recognized. This would have, of course, worked but with an intelligence as large as Atticus's, it was nothing. Everything had eventually paid off as he had baited the perpetrators, and most importantly, he had seen them. If he had to be honest, he had completely leaned on Seraphin, or his brother being the mastermind of his current situation. Never would he have thought that he hadn't been even close. Yes, each of them had been completely covered, but even if Atticus wasn't a people person and wasn't really good at stuff involving politics, if there was one thing Atticus could proudly boast about with his high intelligence, it was his perfect memory retention. No matter how long ago or how brief, even a simple glance was enough. Atticus would never forget. Although Atticus hadn't been able to see their faces, he had been able to hear them speak. He had seen every nuance of their movements, their figures, their gestures, and posture. Atticus saw them all. The one who had given the 100 students the command was the same youth who had been speaking with Leela back then when each of the 15-year-olds of the human domain gathered at the expanse in front of the academy. He had remembered the same annoying tone when he spoke. Atticus hadn't cared enough to learn the youth's name, but, but that wasn't the important thing in this situation. There was only one thing Atticus was focused on. He had finally found out the mastermind behind all of this attack on him, the Alvirian family. 